to Hotel Bar Sessions, the podcast where three philosophers sit down at the end of a long conference day to chop it up at the hotel bar, which, as we all know, is where the real philosophy happens. Welcome back to another episode of Hotel Bar Sessions. I'm Jason Reed, and I'm joined by my co-hosts, Rick Lee and Lee Johnson. And this week, we are talking about Back to Normal. Before we get to that, let's get back to our drink orders and our rants and raves. I'll go first. I will have a Manhattan, please, with rye. It's freezing in Chicago right now, <laughs> and I need to be warm from the inside out. This week, I am ranting, and I think this is a callback rant, but it deserves recall. I am ranting about Governor Greg Abbott of Texas. <laughs> So as many of you are probably aware, he has been sending migrants trying to apply for asylum in the United States to particularly cities that have claimed themselves to be sanctuary cities, and Chicago is one of them. And he continues to do this without letting anyone know when they're coming, where they're going, and so on. And right now, it is minus five degrees with 35 below wind chills in Chicago. And this fucker keeps playing with people's lives and sending them to places like Chicago. If we were in war, this would be a war crime. Yeah. I guess it's just a regular run-of-the-mill crime. Yeah. But it is a crime. So I'm going to have a margarita as a shout out to my favorite bar and restaurant in St. Petersburg, Woody's. And if you know me, this is very surprising. The place has a real Jimmy Buffett vibe. And I'm not a Jimmy Buffett guy, even though it's not a licensed Jimmy Buffett property. It's just kind of on the water in a lazy sort of way. You can watch dolphins swim by, which is what I like about the place. Although I'm a little disappointed they now accept credit cards. <laughs> the cash only thing gave them a kind of exotic sort of locals only <laughs> yeah, feel. Yeah, yeah. And now they accept cards, it seems... But it's still good. And I'm going to rave about landscape with invisible hand. And I'm raving both about the film and the book. I enjoyed the book a few years ago and just caught the recently made film via streaming. It's just a really interesting satire, as the title suggests, about capitalism and about the hustle that the gig economy demands of young people. So check it out if you're looking for science fiction that is fun and engaging. I mean, great performances by Tiffany Haddish and William Jackson Harper in the film as well. Ooh, I like both of them. I'm definitely going to check that out. I am going to have a old smoky caramel infused whiskey. It is also freezing here in Memphis. And today I am going to rave about the reality show, The Challenge. <laughs> So I've been a fan of the challenge since, gosh, when did it start? 1998. This was an MTV show that grew out of the original reality shows, The Real World, and later Road Rules. But it's a competition reality show. But it's had now 38 seasons, which means we've watched these people grow from 20-year-olds to now mid-40-year-olds. And it's really exciting. I don't remember who said this, but somebody said that the challenge is the fourth official sport of the United States, so following football, baseball, and basketball. They keep bringing on new people. If you haven't watched the challenge for all these years, I really recommend jumping into it. There's some of the old crew still around, still competing at their advanced age of mid-40s, but there's <laughs> lots of new people as well. All right, Rick, so I know we're talking about back to normal today. What do you even mean by that? <laughs> so I remember very clearly being in a bar with some of my colleagues. Michael Noss, a former guest on the podcast, was one of them at the end of our winter quarter in 2020 and hearing for the first time that the NCAA had canceled its basketball tournaments for the year. And this was the moment I realized that this virus was going to have tremendous impacts on our daily lives. And then over the next several months, as everyone's aware, mitigation measures became more and more widespread and more and more strict. Then in some places, more quickly than others, we all eventually returned to normal. <laughs> but did we, though? No. <laughs> <laughs> In some ways, normalcy seems to be an irresistible pull. But is normalcy not the same as the status quo? 
And shouldn't we be critical of both normalcy and the status quo? We can look at other contexts in which we have either found a normalcy or found the need to go back to some kind of normalcy. Climate change, who's doing anything about it these days? Anti-democratic presidents, well, that's just the new normal. Hmm. Xenophobia is now a baseline in the U.S., in the Netherlands, in Hungary, in Italy, and the list can go on and on. It is the new normal. So what do we do about the intransigence of normalcy and the claim that we need to get back to normal? So first question is, what does it mean to normalize something or make something the new normal? I was thinking about this in relation to something I've noticed particularly this academic year, and I don't know if the two of you have noticed this as well, but way more of my students are registering with our Center for Students with Disabilities than ever have in the past. And then on top of that, a ton of students are self-reporting to me that they're struggling with anxiety or depression yeah, or yeah. you know other conditions like that. In one way, we say we've gone back to normal. And I'm like, yeah, but the kids are not all right. And by the way, I'm also not all right. And so people struggling on a personal level is a new normal and we're just used to it and nobody seems to be talking about it. I think a lot of the discourse right now urging us to get back to normal sort of imagines that back to normal means before COVID. And I don't want to blame COVID for all of this, right? (laughs) All of the situation that we're in right now. So I think that we too easily forget that after COVID, we had, well, an insurrection. So that, (laughs) you know, we've had really dramatic climate change. I mean, climate change that is affecting our day-to-day lives just in the four years since COVID. And a number of other things, changes in the way that we work, the way that we think about work. There was, of course, the great resignation. There was the quiet quitting. There is now the whole new phenomenon of remote work. So I'm not sure that when we say let's get back to normal as if we could just rewind time and go back to whatever, December 2019. First of all, that that's even possible. And second of all, that really accounts for all of the other things that have happened since And during COVID. I mean, for me, what you're pointing out is that our new normal is like a rolling series of catastrophes. Clearly, some of these mental health problems are arising from the rolling catastrophes. But also, it seems like we're just willing as a public to ignore them, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And we could treat the individual anxiety and depression and so on. But nobody wants to talk about, you know, like current catastrophic syndrome, give it some name like that, (laughs) and talk about it as a public health crisis. To me, it's important, the lack of any public recognition. Like, I remember the months of lockdown of COVID, it was difficult, but there was a sense that at least it was shared. Mm. Like, you know, I remember very vividly walking my dog one night on a street that ordinarily on a Friday night would be filled with cars going to and from bars and restaurants and stuff, and it being eerily quiet and kind of feeling a strange solidarity in that isolation. Mm. Like, people aren't going anywhere. Maybe we're going to beat this, you know, maybe things are going to be all right. And that has shifted to a sense in which everyone is kind of on their own with this, right? I mean, when it comes to COVID, everyone has their own sense of what is safe or not safe for them. Everyone feels like they're isolated and the only person doing whatever it is they're doing. So there's a shared isolation. And the isolation was very difficult for a lot of people. I mean, I think about my brother specifically who lives alone And during the COVID lockdown, he was really struggling. But the isolation was at least shared. Now it's almost the opposite. We're more isolated because we don't publicly acknowledge what it is that we're struggling with. Yeah, and I remember, I mean, it seems like a billion years ago, but those videos of Italians out on their balconies singing songs together in this solidarity of isolation or people holding events outdoors in public to share our isolation. And now there's nothing we share, well, except that we're in a catastrophic situation, but there's no solidarity around that. I'm really glad that we're starting off here with talking about the personal dimensions of this call to get back to normal, because I think we all know when you're talking about psychological 
traumas or even just non-traumatic conditions like isolation, depression, anxiety, those sorts of things. The very worst thing that you can tell someone in that situation is, you know, like, just be happy. Right. Like, you know, just just get back to normal and that'll fix it, right? You can't undo those conditions that easily. And you certainly can't ask people to go back to a psychological or emotional state before that happened and then reoccupy that state as if it didn't happen. But when I think about other catastrophes, like, for example, the insurrection and the very presidency that brought us the insurrection... It seems like there's no call to go back to normal. I I mean, I suppose I hear sometimes from the so-called left that we need to go back to upholding norms and values. And I think that's a very difficult thing to do. Like there's no police force enforcing norms or values. What I worry about is that we are now in the new normal. The new normal is a president who, on the one hand, quotes Adolf Hitler and on the other hand, has never read a book or (laughs) certainly not the one by Adolf Hitler. And people are like, oh, yeah, that's fine. It's okay." Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, of course, he's not president. Not yet. Oh, God, please. No. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, brace yourself, Lee. I think the Trump example is a good example of a kind of schism between normalizing and the new normal Mm. because on the one hand like people still talk about trump as if old rules still might apply Mm. even while they recognize that those rules don't seem to be in effect right people keep talking about well it seems like having multiple trials upcoming would really put a damper on someone's presidential campaign Yet they recognize that the opposite effect seems to happen. And there seems to be within, especially the pundit class, this idea that some candidate is going to emerge and be the sensible alternative to Trump, even though that keeps not happening and is abundantly clear it keeps not happening. So there seems to be both this recognition that there are these old set of rules. It used to be that multiply impeached, multiply convicted would put a damper on your presidential aspirations. Yet those old rules just simply do not apply. And so we seem to be in this permanent interregnum between the old set of rules we think should be valid and the new set of norms that we're not ready to accept as the way the world works now. You know, that we do have, when it comes to Trump, a kind of bizarre cult of personality that is predicated on his violation of the standards of what is supposed to be presidential. That's his appeal. Yeah, I think I'm probably a little bit more, well, significantly more worried, though, about the new normal of the Supreme Court. I mean, these people are not old. They're going to be there for many decades to come. And this is a normalization of the ideology of the current Supreme Court justices and the practices that they're, in some cases, probably illegally implementing, you know, I mean, just in terms of sort of backdoor cash deals and, you know, and peculiar reading of the Constitution, a disregarding of precedent. That worries me a lot yeah. as a new normal. Yeah. And I just heard recently on one of my favorite podcasts I've mentioned before, Dahlia Lithwick's amicus brief, that originally the Supreme Court was taking somewhere around 300 cases a year. And that was before they even had a building or offices. They were doing their work in coffee shops and so on. And now they take 50. Mm. They get to choose which cases they're going to take. And I think, Lee, what you just pointed out, it becomes all the more dangerous because they're choosing the cases they want to adjudicate based on the policy that they want to make all the while acting as if they're not a political branch of the government. Yeah, I mean, I do want to say that for a long time, it was the norm for Supreme Court justices, even if not in practice, at least in principle, to be the apolitical arm of the government. I don't think that's even a principle anymore. Yeah. Although they keep talking about it, Alito especially, that there's no Republican justices and Democratic justices. But I think you're right that a new normal there is being established. And to bring this back to the personal, if I think about what the Supreme Court has been doing, and then when I think about like the whole four years of Donald Trump's presidency, and then when I think about climate change, and then go back to the pandemic and the lockdown, 
I had to stop myself from doom scrolling the news every single day because mm-hmm. on the one hand, I got a perverse pleasure out of it all the while. It was destroying me on the inside. But one of the downsides of doom scrolling is precisely, I don't know if it becomes the new normal, but at least you become desensitized to things. Mm-hmm. You know, if everything is a catastrophe, then nothing's a catastrophe. And I think that's part of Trump's strategy of what did he call it or what did they call it? Flooding the zone. Just have catastrophe after catastrophe after catastrophe, and then no one can focus on anything in particular. Yeah. And with the climate stuff, you can't ignore it, right? I mean, we're recording this in mid-January. Memphis is currently under several inches of snow, completely shut down. The temperature outside is something like negative seven right now. I don't know about you guys, but like, I cannot ignore this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, on the one hand, we can't ignore it. But on the other hand, it seems like we are doing a pretty good job of ignoring it. Mm. Why aren't even weather people, when they report the weather, saying today we're experiencing a climate change induced cold snap in Memphis, the likes of which has never been seen. Tomorrow we're going to experience a climate change induced flood in Portland, Maine, and so on and so on. We're just not talking about it. Right. We keep calling these things 100 year storms, even though they're happening way more frequently than every 100 years. We keep talking as if the exceptions are exceptions and not part of this new normal. And we don't really know how to adjust to it. I mean, I feel like in the past couple of years, weather has ceased to be this backdrop to existence Mm -hmm. that you can sometimes pay Mm -hmm. attention to only occasionally in extreme events and has become much more dynamic. You have to think a lot more about floods, storms, things that used to seem exceptional become more normal. But it's very difficult because most of our lives, I mean, the way our built world is structured is to construct a kind of indifference to weather, right? We have houses, we have buildings, we have roads. All these things are to make it so we don't need to think about the conditions outside of us. But we're finding us have to think about those conditions when they involve extreme temperatures to either end and other extreme events that we're just not used to. Yeah, and sorry to get back to the national politics, but to fold that in, again, here, we're having to pay attention to these things, and some of the attention that we're having to pay is to the crumbling infrastructure around us, all the while having a Congress that has zero interest in having any kind of a short-term or long-term plan about repairing our national infrastructure, or at least trying to make it, I mean, you can't make it weatherproof now, but at least more weather resistant, maybe. Right. But I think that points out, and maybe this goes back to Jason's talking about being in the interregnum between no norms and new norms, or old norms and new norms. But I think there are two pushes toward normalcy. One is the one you saw in the pandemic in primarily red states where we're going to open the schools, we're going to open stores, we're going to get rid of mask mandates, social distancing, and quote unquote, get back to normal. And so there's that kind of political push. But on the other hand, don't you think that this retreating to normalcy is a psychological defense mechanism? Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. that I'm about to be psychologically destroyed destroyed by these rolling catastrophes. And so I have to find some ground in some kind of normalcy, whatever it is. Right. I completely agree with that. I would like to put a call out to our, I'm sure, vast meteorological expert audience (laughs) to please provide us with a list. I would really love to see a list of how many times in the last three, four years we've had unprecedented weather events. Yeah. Or as Jason put it, 100-year events that seem to be happening every several months. Yeah. I mean, I think it wouldn't be dissimilar to what we see in the unfortunate list that is out there now, like how many mass shootings are we having or Mm -hmm. how often are they happening? Mm -hmm. Right. We could add that to the list of rolling catastrophes as well, Mm -hmm. the epidemic of mass shootings. Mm. On the one hand, we've talked often about the thoughts and prayers stupidity. But on the other hand, can an individual psychologically maintain a focus on these kinds of catastrophes and not just go insane? Did you know that Hotel Bar Podcast is more than just a podcast? We are a fully online 
cross-brand synergy platform of content creation. Actually, that's not true. Those words are meaningless. But you can follow us on the app formerly known as Twitter at Hotel Bar Podcast. There you can find the handles of all the co-hosts as well. You can follow us all or pick your favorite. If by the time you hear this, Elon Musk has burned down the servers to collect the insurance, you can also find us on Facebook or YouTube. Just look for Hotel Bar Sessions. Wherever you find us on social media, you can contact us with ideas, complaints, and questions. You can also email us anytime at hotelbarpodcast at gmail.com or visit our interactive page at hotelbarpodcast.com. No matter how you get in contact with us, we're always glad to hear from you. When I think about who is saying, let's get back to normal, I think it's employers. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I think that that has to do largely with the fact that so much changed during COVID and then, of course, after COVID. One of the things that worries me is that this imperative to return to normal, you know, get back to the office, get back to in-person work, get back to in-person education, et cetera, et cetera, amidst all the other things that have happened, including the climate changes that we've been talking about, dramatic inflation. I mean, look at the cost of eggs now compared to only four years ago, not to mention important things like rent and utilities. And the actual crisis that we've seen in corporations, I include higher education institutions among those. Right. The new normal is a increased precarity for workers despite this constant refrain, let's get back to work, let's get back to normal. Mm -hmm. Right. The demand to get back to work, which really means get back to the office or get back to in-person work. I'm not an expert in this, but from what I understand, productivity did not decrease when people were working from home. Exactly. And so then one has to wonder, what is exactly the demand to return back to the office and return back to work? And I think here, I would take a page out of Adorno's argument about the culture industry, namely that there's something about going to the office being under supervision by management that regulates your life in a way that then you don't critically reflect on the actual conditions of your life. Now, once you're at home and you work for an hour and then go for a walk and then work for two more hours and then have lunch, those moments when you go out for a walk are moments where you could think about like, what the fuck am I doing? (laughs) Yeah. And let's not forget that along with workers coming to realize that their working conditions don't have to be as alienating, as miserable as, you know, we normally expect them to be. We also realized a lot of other things during COVID as workers, not the least of which is that the government could do a lot more to provide Mm. a basic minimal safety net for us. Corporations are still going to make money. They're going to make a lot of money, even when the federal government is providing that net. We really shouldn't have to question whether or not it's possible for people, for example, to have a universal basic income, for people to have their basic medical needs met. Right. I think we have to make a distinction between, or at least I make a distinction between the early phase of the return to normal in COVID, where it was overtly stated in the summer of 2020 that people are going to need to sacrifice their lives, right? This sense of like, yes, people might get sick, but, you know, we sacrificed during wars. We're going to sacrifice again to get back to normal. That was overt and prescribed. And then what eventually happened, where you had the same things Only it was not really talked about in terms of this overt demand for sacrifice. It was just like, well, what are we going to do? We have to get back. Yeah, we can't keep Mm, doing this anymore. No one wanted to talk about another relief check. No one wanted to talk about doing anything else. There was just this sense like it's just the way it is. You know, it reminds me of that line from Marx when Marx says that capitalist mode of production requires a working class which treats its demands as self-evident natural laws, right? And the part of the self-evidence had to do with not just selling your labor to go to work, but selling your labor at an office. Right. You know, and I think part of what's driving is the return to offices. I mean, look what happened to San Francisco. 
tons of business property is now just sitting empty and not making anyone any money. And part of it was we have to go back because these people need to make a return on their investment. Even though it had nothing to do, as we're saying, with productivity, with actually getting the work done, the necessity was a necessity of just returning profits and returning to unthinking relationship to the norms of work right. itself. Kind of parallel to that return to work, but return to work in the office. We saw in higher education this press to return to higher education like it was before COVID, like it was before anything went online. Right. And look, I know that there's a lot of disagreement about this. But from my perspective, I think that the hype about how much students hate online learning is grossly overinflated. The idea that that was a blip in the timeline and now we need to go back to in-person learning and forget we ever heard of Zoom, that is impossible. That's not going to happen. There are a lot of advantages to online learning and to expanding the opportunities for students. We keep repeating this narrative about how much students hate online learning and how awful it is so that I'm sorry, but our older colleagues don't have to get off their asses and learn how to do it well, right. learn how to do it right. Because the fact is, is that there is a lot of good to online learning if you do it well, but, you know, they just don't want to do it well. Well, and I'm with you on this, Lee. Part of what we forget is that perhaps what students may have been reporting when they were reporting not liking online learning was the fact that many of them had to move back home with their parents. They didn't have places to really work and study. Some of them were doing childcare either for their own children or for siblings or cousins. So it was online learning, sure, but in the least ideal circumstances. Yeah, and a lot of their classes sucked. The professors made them suck. Well, and I was going to say that then on the other side of it, I think a lot of professors thought, I'm just going to pretend like Zoom is the classroom. Right. And the problem is that clearly it's not. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean it's worse. It doesn't mean it's better. It just means it's not. So you have to think about what you're doing. You have to use the affordances that the technology provides to provide quality work. And I think that there is absolutely no reason why, even in philosophy, we can't be delivering quality online education. I think the resistance to it, especially among many of my colleagues, is based on a belief that the classroom is a magical place. Mm. You know, anything can happen in the classroom and we need to be in there together. Yeah, and I'm not going to adjust to any facts to the contrary, right? I mean, I think one thing that we also left out of meaningfully important non-normal events of the last three years was Chad GPT. And I think this is another thing that's happening with higher education is that we're just, we're not adjusting to the existence of Chat GPT. We're just treating it like old-fashioned cheating. Right which it's not, <laughs> and we're not adjusting to it, to our peril. Right. We're never going to go back to higher education before chat GPT. We're never going to go back to higher education before online learning. It's never going to happen. This is the new normal. Right. I remember reading someone saying that perhaps COVID would do the same for indoor air quality yeah. as previous diseases did to raw sewage, right. yeah. pretty much. You know, there was a point at which raw sewage flowed in cities and there are all kinds of diseases brought about by that. There have been studies that shown that there's a lot we could do to improve indoor air quality, not just for COVID, but for flu, colds, etc. Yeah. And I think the world just looked at that information and thought, well, that's really expensive. Yeah. We're not doing that. I mean, one of the other things to think about is how there's an entire demarcation along class lines about what people's new normals are. Right. And some people can afford that sort of equipment. I mean, if you go to Davos, apparently they're scrubbing the air. All the people behind the scenes are masked. You know, they're doing everything they can to protect the lives of those people. Whereas in a regular public school, keep the window open is the best you can yeah. do yeah. to improve the air quality. So I think the sense of what is possible is intimately intertwined with the sense of what is profitable. And what has proven to be profitable has been a way to just keep people dealing with this as an individual, 
matter. And I think that's an important thing, too, is that all the things we've talked about, climate change, COVID, the demise of democracy, these are all things that require collective responses. Yeah. I mean, you can wear a mask, you can wear sunblock, move to higher land. You can drink or whatever. out of a plastic straw. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you could do all these little things, but they're not going to address the fundamental issues. They require collective response. I, I follow Jim Gaffigan on Instagram, and he puts clips of his shows on from time to time. And he had one recently that said, do you know how you know climate change is real? It's because even those who used to deny it no longer deny it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They just say it's not because of humans. You know, one of the ways it's being actually taken seriously is it's really difficult to get home insurance and even car insurance if you live in places near the coast. Mm. So the corporations are taking it seriously in terms of how it affects their bottom line. No one's taking it seriously in terms of policy, though. Right. So it already is being recognized as a reality. And I think this goes back to what I was saying with the interregnum type feeling is that at different levels, things are being acknowledged, but there's no consistent overall. It's this weird, torn, like, Part of us is living in an old world and part of us is acting as if things have changed. But I think underlying what you're talking about, Jason, is a really profound point, namely that capitalism and profit is always the norm. There are various ways to get to it, get back to it, go forward to it. So it's either reactionary and conservative, like get back to the office and so on, but it can be quite revolutionary and cunning and break down norms when that's the path to greater profits. And so it seems like the economy is driving what we're calling normal. And yet it's still shocking how these catastrophes have not motivated more forward thinking. Yes. I'm constantly shocked. You would think a global plague, right? A global pandemic would have made this country rethink its healthcare system. Yeah. Would make this country rethink the conditions of its working classes. You would think that the AI explosion of the last three years would make us seriously rethink regulating tech companies, would make us seriously rethink how to modify education at all levels, including higher education. You would think that climate crises would motivate us to rethink how to invest in clean energy, right? How to harm these terrible summers mm. to warm us in these terrible winters, you know, how to think about planning for our coastal cities. But none of that is, I mean, what kind of disaster has to happen? You know, I used to think that it would take a plague, it would take a climate disaster, it would take a real AI explosion for us to sort of sit up and take notice and do something. Now I'm like, I've, I've got nothing left on my list but aliens, right? Like, I think it's going to take aliens. <laughs> I'm not even sure that'll help. <laughs> I think about this in a way too, Lee, namely that I thought at the beginning of the pandemic, and we can go back to like the Italian singing on balconies and, you know, the kind of solidarity we had. I thought maybe this is a moment in which the isolated, self-reliant, liberal subject, I mean that in the capital L sense of liberal individual subject, was going to die away and we were going to finally realize We're that, all in this together. Right. There is no individual without society. It took only seven months before <laughs> you have people like, you know, friend of the podcast, Ron DeSantis, um, <laughs> Talking about individual rights and the government has no right to do this and freedom and the old tropes then get retrenched. And there, I think you see the combination between this political theory and the economic motives underlying DeSantis as well. Yeah, I mean, the lesson I took from this is that events don't have a political force on their own. Mm. The idea that there'd be the right play, the right ecological crisis, even the aliens, <laughs> I don't believe in anymore. <laughs> Events can be interpreted or acted on in multiple different ways. And one of the stunning things, I mean, I remember thinking very naively when COVID began, I thought this is the end of the anti-vaxxer movement. Mm -hmm. Because the anti-vaxxers, like when people weren't seeing the effects of measles and other diseases, it made sense. It's kind of like, oh, I don't want this. But once people saw mass death, anti-vaxxers would disappear. Now, I could not have been more wrong. Yeah. 
And in fact, it seems to have fueled not only opposition to the COVID vaccines, but there's renewed opposition to other vaccines and measles is on the rise. But I think the lesson I took from that is that an event by itself doesn't really have one political lesson that could be drawn Mm. from it. And in some sense, it has multiple possibilities, and the possibilities that are realized might not be the possibility you would have thought. There has been a massive attempt to dismantle public health to the extent that it exists in the face of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. You would have thought it would have gone the opposite Mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. Why some of these more radical things didn't happen? I think at a certain point, one of two things is going to happen with COVID. Either we were going to rethink what public health meant and recognize how sick days are not just beneficial for the lazy bastards who get to take (laughs) advantage of them, but are beneficial for all of society. We were either going to go in that direction, we were going to go a direction in which vaccines are considered to be an imposition you know, it's one of those socialism or barbarism moments. And unfortunately, we pick barbarism. Yeah. Mm. yeah. What you're saying reminds me of a book I read a while ago called Cunning Intelligence in Greek Culture and Society, co-authored by two French classicists, Marcel Detienne and Jean-Pierre Vernon. Their argument is that an event, let's say like COVID, is not itself enough to cause something. You need someone to understand the event and to seize the moment. What they point out is there's a kairos, right? So the example they give is in a chariot race, one person might know there's a dip in the track at a certain point, but that won't do anything unless that person also knows exactly the right moment to seize that opportunity and do something with it. I think, Jason, isn't this what either Althusser or Lenin or both called the conjuncture? Mm -hmm. So this thing happened, and yet... (laughs) We missed the moment. We missed the moment to seize on this opportunity to push in a different direction. I really like that, Rick. And I think when someone says, let's get back to normal, the translation of that is, do not understand this moment (laughs) and do not seize it. (laughs) Do not seize the day. Do not (laughs) seize it. Drop it. Drop it. (laughs) Just step away. There's nothing to see here. (laughs) the hotel bar, Rick, Jason, and I like to pour philosophy straight into your ears. We're an independent and ad-free podcast, and we'd like to keep it that way. But the only way we can do that is with listener support. You can help us defray some of our production costs by signing up to support us on Patreon at patreon.com backslash hotel bar sessions. There are several levels of monthly donations there that you can sign up for, and every one of them helps us keep raising our glasses to deep conversations. If you'd prefer to make a one-time donation or several one-time donations, just visit our website at hotelbarpodcast.com where you can find links to support the podcast through Venmo, PayPal, or Cash App, and you can keep enjoying our tipsy philosophy and sobering insights. I was taken aback by the essays that the Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben was writing during lockdowns in Italy, where he lives. Part of his argument was the lockdowns were showing that we are preferring a notion of life that is based just on our biological needs, eating, drinking, reproducing, well, and then living would be one of them, (laughs) and that there is a notion of life that goes beyond that. And that is really what we talk about when we say things like a life worth living. What gives value to life is something beyond the biological needs. Now, I'm with him on that point, that there is a danger in attending only to the biological. But I think as we heard from John Protevi, and was that last season or the season before, like people do need to live in order to live well. Right. And so the blanket criticism of public health measures being taken was a little bit dangerous to my mind. 
and shows a moment in which philosophers can provide some element of theory, but we also need some experts who know things about like viruses to also help us along because we're not going to theorize our way to the end of a pandemic. Mm-hmm. It was more than a little bit dangerous. I mean, millions of people died. Yeah. Tens of millions of their friends and families, I suspect, would say it was more than a little bit dangerous. Yeah. And I mean, right. I just, it, I don't want to blame him for those deaths, but yeah. like, it, it <laughs> yeah. was irresponsible, first of all, I think, as well. Yeah. The Agaben thing reminds me of a dig that Foucault gets in at Bataille and others and their critique of the Nazis in History of Sexuality, Volume 1, where he says, we need to adjust our critique of power to its actual function. He criticizes them for being kind of caught up in the spectacle of the Nazis and not understanding its real engagement with racial pseudoscience and Mm. so on. To some extent, people like Agamben and other criticisms, which were like, the state could seize this moment to impose a new regime of surveillance and control. We'd all have to have our vaccine cards. We'd all have to monitor where we go at all points. And there's a certain point like, yes, it could do that. But then after a while, when it was clear that it didn't and wasn't. I mean, some private businesses engaged in checking vaccine cards. I remember having a show one. The state didn't do that. The state's imperative was just get back to work. I mean, I think the thing that Agamben misses in his division between bare life and form of life is the particular life that is demanded in capitalism, which is this life of being abstract labor power. That's the real bare right. life. Right. Your capacity yeah. to work. And yes, there was a sense in which at a certain point, this reluctantly caused the state to do some things that were kind of unprecedented. They gave people money for just staying at home. They increased minimum wage. They did things that were unprecedented to keep capitalism functioning. But once it became clear that those things were no longer needed, its demand was simply back to work. A demand of a certain kind of not over-coercive state that Agamben's worried about, but what Ruth Wilson Gilmore calls abandonment, Mm. right? The state sort of abandoned people and said, oh, you're on your own now. And sustained that more or less. I mean, I saw recently a thing with Biden's press secretary where someone said, do you want to say anything about the increase of COVID over the winter of 2023, 2024? We see cases going up. We see hospitalizations going up. And they basically said, no, we're not in that business anymore. We don't do that. Mm. If hospitals want to increase the mass things, if cities want to do it, if individuals want to do it, they can. We're not in this business anymore. And that's abandonment. Yeah. It's pretty much you can buy masks, you can buy tests, you can buy HEPA filters, you can buy all that stuff, but don't expect any public response to this anymore. Well, and what's disturbing about that is that part of the rationale that the medical community, nurses and doctors were claiming at the beginning of the pandemic is The problem with not imposing mitigation measures is that the hospital is now taken up by only COVID patients and everyone else is shoved aside. And so, you know, Mm -hmm. if you're in a car accident, good luck to you. I hope you know how to stitch your own arm. (laughs) And that was their worry. And that seems like a particularly important and I would say relatively benign power of government is to gather some statistics, see some trends, and try to make sure that a resource like healthcare is available for as many people who need it as possible, and not to abandon us precisely in that way. Abandon us to our heart attacks and our car accidents and strokes and whatever, because, well, freedom, freedom, freedom. Yeah, I think we see the same thing in response to the environmental crisis and the tech crisis, which is that the government is saying, yeah, okay, cities, if you want to repair your infrastructure, fine. (laughs) Universities, if you want to make bizarro rules about how you understand AI, fine. But the federal government is not going to make any long-term plan about infrastructure, about energy usage, about tech oversight. None of that is going to happen 
we really are back to normal. We really are back to the individual, as Rick said, classically capital L, liberal, self-reliant, you know, what did you say? Like freedom shouting (laughs) mode of life. And that mode of life, as Jason said, is a mode of life that is only interested in maintaining the masses as abstract producers of labor. Right. It confuses the freedom of the market for freedom as a whole. And I think this goes back to what Jason was saying, that the laws of the market now appear to us to be natural laws or even metaphysical laws, like the freedom of the individual is the freedom to sell their labor on the so-called open and free market. I think the demands, especially in the hands of people like DeSantis, to open up again were really just demands to get back out there and sell us your labor. (laughs) Yeah, suppose one way to look at it, if you sort of take a few steps back and squint a little, is that we did return to normal. Mm. We are back to normal. Like nothing has changed. You know, the economy is still functioning in the same way that it was before. Our approach to the environment, our approach to tech, all of these things are exactly the same. The actual conditions of the workers because of inflation, because of the biological and environmental conditions is worse, probably significantly worse, but not not the norm. Right not meaningfully different than it was before. So the people shouting back to normal, nothing ever really changed for them, Mm. right? It's gotten worse for the rest of us, but not abnormal. So is that the old normal or the new normal? It's all the same normal. (laughs) It's just normal. It's normal all the way down. I mean, like what changed really? If I look at whatever, January 2019 and January 2024, Sure, a lot of things have happened. You know, pretty eventful Mm. things have happened. But day to day, my life, pretty much the same. You know, it's more precarious, but the economy is functioning in the same way. Our democracy is more or less functioning in the same way. Our approach to the environment is the same. The relationship between the government and tech, same thing. It's the same normal. I mean, it's changed for me on an individual basis. Yeah. You know, I find myself one of the strange oddballs wearing a mask on a plane when I'm traveling and doing things like saying, oh, let's, if we're going to go out to eat, let's go someplace where you can sit outside. Mm. Hard to do in Maine in January 2024. (laughs) So I find myself living strangely out of sync with a normal that exists. But the norm of you as a worker is the same, right? If you want to protect yourself against the ravages of the world around you, that's on you. Right, yeah. And while you're doing that, other people are making a lot of money. Unprecedented (laughs) amounts Or as Trump would say, unprecedented. I mean, we're like within, what did they say now? We're within seven years of having the first trillionaire? Mm. Go us. (laughs) 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 But I think Jason's pointing out another side to the politics here. When you, Jason, were talking about wearing a mask on a plane and you were like, I'm one of those oddballs, I remember being, okay, in Florida. (laughs) I was stupidly in Florida. (laughs) We had ordered some pizza to take home with us. My sister and I were about to enter the pizzeria and we put our masks on. And these three people came out and the first guy looks at the two of us standing by the door with our masks on and he says, weirdos. (laughs) weirdos. <laughs> and Rick's like, I've always been a weirdo. This is my normal. <laughs> this is my new flavor of weirdo. Yeah, stay weird. But <laughs> clearly, these decisions, which were put on us because, as Jason, you were discussing, we were abandoned by the government, by public health officials, and so on. They also then were perceived, all of them, as political positions. And so wearing a mask means you're probably a snowflake liberal who is woke and probably works in a DEI department of some elite (laughs) Ivy University. You know, back in the 80s, the notion that the personal is the political was a left slogan But I think the right made it come true, and it's really ugly. Mm. It's extremely ugly because it is now really a fracturing on a personal level that matches the political fracturing that is apparent in the U.S. currently. I agree Mm. with your point. I think what the right did, though, was that they adopted the personal as political with this tweak 
the individual is political. Mm -hmm. Well, because there is no society except for a group of free individuals who freely contract to get together. And shout freedom. And shout freedom. (laughs) And it is interesting to see that as, I don't want to say a uniquely American thing, but definitely something that is- Typically American. Typically American, intensely American. I remember seeing stories of during the same years of COVID, there's a massive conflict over amending the constitution in Chile. And there are these Mm. pictures of both sides you know, leftists and fascists pretty much. And they were both wearing masks. Yeah. You know, they were willing to come to blows in the street, but they both agreed that they should protect themselves and others from the pandemic, even though they're willing to come into all other forms of political conflict. So the mask thing didn't need to be political. Mm. And I wonder to what extent this politicization is coupled with a sort of depoliticization at the same time. Yeah. As everything gets reduced as kind of an individual expression of one's own identity, it effaces the possibility of collective action and collective conditions. Yeah. It's a politics of self-expression and resentment, not a politics of collective action and mobilization. It's almost like a politics of anti-solidarity. And I think someone may want to write about that. <laughs> yeah. Agamben, you listening? <laughs> <laughs> Giorgio, come stai? Well, one thing that is normal, hasn't changed, is that we've gotten last call. And so that means that we have to leave. I hate the normal. (laughs) But I thought we might just take a minute to go around the horn here with final thoughts. I'll just say as a final thought that on its surface, the phrase, let's get back to normal, is a fundamentally conservative phrase. And I think that we've seen the ugliness of that flavor of conservatism in the last three years. I also want to say, again, I don't think that we can just blame COVID for why it is that this clarion call to return to normal is so loud and so imperative right now. I think a lot of things happened during and since COVID, and they seem to threaten at times the ability for rich people to get even richer. So I want to say that COVID is just one element in a kind of bouquet of terrible elements of the last four years. But Rick, what about you? Well, I want to thank you guys for indulging me on this because as I said at the beginning of this, you know, I've noticed that in my classroom, the kids are not all right. And I've noticed even in myself that while I'm back in the classroom and I'm teaching and, you know, I do go to a bar and I'm inside, I still do notice in me a kind of lingering after effect of the isolation and the lockdown Mm -hmm. that I think we need to talk more about and we need to be really attentive to the suffering that many people are still experiencing as a result of, and I appreciate, Lee, you opening my eyes, it's not just the pandemic, but I think it is also this, what I call the rolling catastrophes that are also partly responsible. So thanks for indulging me and helping me think through this. Jason, what about you? I think we all act in such a way that we're trying to realize our goals and intentions against a backdrop of what we assume the future is going to be. And I think we're beginning to realize how incomplete our knowledge of that future is and how subject it is to change and revision. Nice. Sometimes I think, should I be continuing in my career or should I be working on my bunker? <laughs> you know, it's sort of like I find myself torn between two very different ideas about what the future is going to be. And that's, I think how much it's difficult to think about this tension between the normal that we're nostalgic for and the normal that we're creating but we're not yet recognizing at the same time. And it almost feels like you have to learn how to live in two very different worlds at once. The one that is based on the repetition of the past that still is there, as we've been saying, like we've gone back to work, to some extent things do look normal, and the one that is based on a radical transformation of the mm. past. Well, you guys, this has been a unusual, <laughs> not abnormal, but an unusual conversation. I am also really glad that we had it. We got to get out of here. Take care, everyone. <laughs> yeah, until they leave. <laughs> bye. Bye. All right, bye. <laughs>